the greatest gift of it all has been this like resilience that develops in you. Don't quit. Keep going. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden with the Kara Golden Show, and I'm so excited for my next guest. I'm very, very excited to have Melissa Papak. Am I pronouncing your last yes, name right? Yes, you got it. <laughs> so Melissa is the founder and president of Cabana Life. And I'm, like I said, I'm so excited to have her here to talk a little bit more about her very, very fashionable brand that she started. And really started it out of her own backstory and solving a problem for herself, which uh, that sounds really, really familiar for those <laughs> of you who know my own backstory. But let's see, she's been featured on Good Morning America and the Today Show and the Wall Street Journal as a thought leader in UV protection and also has been worn her products, that is, by People like Gwyneth Paltrow, Adam Sandler. So it's not just for women, by the way. There are, this is also a men's line. Who else? Kate Hudson, Nicole Kidman. And she did not come from this industry either. So I love her, her story and stories like this where people are jumping from one industry and, uh, although it might be very humbling at times, asking all the right questions in order to, uh, really do what they want to do and create a company. And her background was in magazines, but her interest in creating Cabana Life, as I mentioned, was really out of her own uh, personal experience that she was uh, faced with. So I'll let her get into that. But first of all, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Super excited. So tell me a little bit first before we get into the backstory of Cabana Life, who was M Melissa as a little kid and what is your origin story? So Melissa was a little girl growing up in Long Island, New York, kind of lost the accent a little bit and um, red hair, freckles, just a happy go lucky outgoing girl. Um, my mother was always protecting me in the sun because I was so fair and had blue eyes and a gazillion and one freckles. Um, lived a very happy, normal childhood. I did have a lot of, you know, family around all the time and there was a family business. So I would often be at the dinner table hearing about marketing ideas and the entrepreneurial journey um, because my grandfather ran um, an electronics appliance company that he had inherited from my, um, my grandmother's parents. So it started in the twenties and was carried on throughout the generation. So definitely grew up with a lot of business talk, but certainly was not the little girl, Melissa, with red hair and freckles. who's like, I want to be an entrepreneur. It was just something that was always around me. So grew up there, went off to Tulane University in New Orleans, which is to this day my happy place. Love that city. And um, went to college there and majored in marketing and then you know, went on from there. And then you came back to New York after school and so, yes. started in the magazine. Actually, I had one stop before the magazine industry, which was quite pivotal um, in, in the food, gourmet foods industry. I ah. applied for a job right out of college, um, faxed my resume. And it's kind of a funny story because the owner of the company called to tell me that I did not get the job because he got the wrong cover letter with the resume and he just called me to let me know I wasn't getting the job. And I quickly started, you know, thinking on my feet and talking to him and telling him all the reasons why really it was probably the person at FedEx Kinko's and that, um, you know, really I'm like such a perfect fit for this. P.S. I don't think he had anyone else for the job at the time. And we laugh about that now, but managed to get myself that job. You know, there were no, there wasn't Zoom at the time. I mean, this is like 96. So sight unseen, signed up for this gourmet foods company, startup company, um, and went back to New York, reported for my first day of work in the basement of a building next to a trash compactor, a team meeting. Um, Good time. And, I, and I was just like, OK. And I didn't know. I mean, I had like a briefcase and my suit on and I was like ready to go. And he was maybe 26 at the time and I was 21. And I think I was one of the very first employees. And it was a company called PeaceWorks that was um, 
all about bringing Arabs and Israelis together through commerce. And the entrepreneur was Daniel Lubetsky, who ultimately I turned it say, into I didn't realize kind of about you. Wow. Oh, yes. So I was there for a year with Daniel and, you know, really got that whole entrepreneurial bug. I loved the chaos. I loved the craziness, the ideas, like nothing was too wild or outlandish. We were promoting these Mediterranean spreads and we said, hey, why don't we get a camel and... um you know, parade it down in Tribeca and have Ben Cohen from Ben and Jerry's, who was on our board, ride the camel. So again, this is like oh my the 90s. It's not like camels are readily available. There's not Google to be like, where do I get a camel? So it was just like coming up with these ideas, executing on them, like nothing was too outlandish. So love that year that I spent there and then ended up um, applying for a job at Time Out New York magazine because they were just launching in the city and bringing that over from London. Um, and I think I always had this like glamour magazine idea in my head during college. That was like my real wish of getting a job in like fashion or magazines. So when I was able to secure that position, um, and it was also a very entrepreneurial launch environment. Um, and every week we were publishing a new issue. I, again, at this point was 22, 23. You just raise your hand for everything. They were like, had just let their PR people go and, they said, do you know how to do PR? And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 of course. You know, I, I of course. And then I'm like sitting there like looking at their press releases and their pitches, figuring it out. And I also wrote a page in the magazine every week um, uh, with like offers and competitions and just loved that like fast pace, just constantly doing different things, environment, wearing so many different hats and just being creative and taking that kind of scrappy mentality that I learned at PeaceWorks and saying, okay, this person's on the cover. And they're like, well, you don't have a budget for it. I'm like, okay, well, can we leverage this contact I have in this contact and get the alcohol sponsor? And then next thing you know, you have all these people coming to this amazing event that you've just conceptualized and pulled together. You don't need to have huge budgets to like leverage the resources that you have. So I loved those challenges in both of those early experiences that I had. And how long were you there at Time Out then? So Time Out, I was there for about two and a half years. And then like so many people in in that environment, I feel like the masthead, Condé Nast would come and pick over and you'd get plucked away by like the big, glossy, glamorous Condé Nast. So got the call from Condé Nast and went over to Self Magazine, which I very quickly realized I did not like to be siloed. And it was just going from this really, you know, cool London startup vibe where it was like we were in it felt like we were in finals every week as you're closing the magazine to self magazine where I was like kind of pigeonholed into writing proposals and I was like ooh, I'm like this you know is not for me but thankfully um one of my bosses at the time I think recognized that too and she's like don't tell anyone that I told you this but 17 magazine is looking for a merchandising editor I think you'd be awesome She's like, and she had worked there at one point and she's like, you're going to love it. And so I ended up moving over to 17 magazine where I um, toured with boy bands and I was like the added value for all the advertisers. So we create oh like God. huge How events fun. and like every weekend I was traveling with like soap stars, boy bands. And, but I think one of the nicest parts was um, they would put my picture in the magazine and say, come out and meet Melissa at Mall of America. And these little girls would come out with their magazines and a pen and like ask for my autograph. And you had that opportunity to impact them. And like whether it was just like a little nod or picking them to be part of this program or, you know, they were just so eager and like good and kind hearted. And I feel like I didn't have kids at the time, but it was just such a amazing experience to be able to like meet, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of teenagers. I went to how many proms? I can't even tell you during my 20s. But um, it was cool. I mean, it was definitely a fun early work experience. A fun journey. And so you, in I guess when you were 26, do I have the age right? You were then diagnosed with skin cancer, malignant melanoma. Um, mm-hmm. not the news that anyone wants to hear. And, uh, I've had basal cell myself. Um, so a different type of, of cancer, but it was, um, I remember just having, you know, the pit of my stomach thinking, why did I 
answer the phone that day. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, you know, it's just, you don't want to hear this and you're, I'm sure in denial yeah. and tears and everything else trying to figure out what do you do? And so what was that, you know, moment like? So I look back and to this day, I am so grateful because my journey could have ended so much earlier and so badly. Mm -hmm. Um, because when I was living and working in the magazines and running around like crazy, I assure you health and wellness was the last thing on my mind. It was friends, party and career. And, um, I, I think I probably just got a new health insurance and had to establish a primary care physician and went for a physical. Cause at 26, you're not really like rolling into your physical yeah, every yeah. year religiously. Let's face it. So went for my physical. And the physician's assistant said, you know, do you get regular skin checks because of your, your fair and you have the type of skin that you could be prone to skin cancer? And I was like, oh, yeah, I've heard that growing up. I know that. But no, I haven't been. And he's like, just make an appointment down the hall as a dermatologist and you just make an appointment for a skin check. And again, like I could have just walked out yeah. and gone back and done my thing. But for whatever reason, stopped, made the appointment and then went back for a skin check. However, long after that, when my appointment came up went into the dermatologist, didn't know them and got a skin check. And he's like, Oh, everything looks fine. And I said, and I swear, I think it was that it was such a fast skin check. I felt like I was getting gypped and wanted like my full co-pays worth or something. Yeah. And he said at the end, he's like, do you have any questions? And I said, well, what's this, what's this, what's this, what's this, what's this. And one of my, what's this is was a very light pink mark on my left arm. And the reality is, you know, it didn't look like anything they tell you to yeah. look for for skin cancer. It was pink, which now knowing redheads often present a melanotic, which is like without um, tone. So I thought it was like a scar from a mosquito bite from being in the Hamptons that summer, or it was the 90s in New York City. It could have been like a nick from a cigarette out at a nightclub. It was that long ago. And um, he, you know, sprayed it, looked a little closer and he said, why don't you come back for a biopsy at your leisure? again, translation at your leisure at 26, but managed to get back for this biopsy, wasn't really worried. And they said, we'll call you in a few weeks with the results. Sure enough, two days later at 17 Magazine, I get that phone call. They wouldn't tell me over the phone. They said, you have to come here right now. And I was so freaked out. And I was like, well, this is not good. What do I do? And I was like, so I went and I told my boss and I said, I was like, I, I don't know. They want me to come there right now, like right this minute. And in the ultimate boss move, and you kind of think about who you want to be like, she's like, I'm coming with you. And I was like, no, no, it's okay. You don't have to like interrupt your day. And she's like, she's like, I'm coming. So the two of us walked over and they wouldn't tell me in front of her. They pulled me into a room and they said, um, you have melanoma. And I, and it's so embarrassing to say now, but I was literally like, am I going to have a scar? Um, because at the time I was dating this guy who's now my husband and all I knew is he had a melanoma on the back of his leg when he was in his twenties. He had this big like dollar coin size wow. scar. And the doctor looked at me. He's like, you could die. Like, you, don't worry about the scar. You could die. I'm like, wait, no, 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 no. Like I'm 26. This is skin cancer. Like that's cancer light. Like you're just going to cut it out and I'm going to be fine. And he's like, no, no. He's like, this is melanoma and people die from this. And um, I felt so bad calling my mom and saying, I have cancer. And she basically was like, okay, I'll see you soon. I'll call you back. And she got on the phone, got me an appointment with an amazing surgeon in New York City, pulled strings, got in. And thankfully, um, it had not spread. And what started out as the size of smaller than an eraser head you know, 200 stitches, a five inch scar later, they were able to get everything um, in that one visit. That's and incredible. Yeah. So that was um, very, very just, it was such a whirlwind and so eye opening. And I was just taking in so much information as I'm sitting there in my paper gown. And I remember being there and hearing these stats that I had never heard before. Nobody was talking about it. Um, one in five Americans get some form of skin cancer. I was like, what? One in five? That is like a lot. That's yeah, your mother, your friend. And like prior that's... to 26, you just don't, you know, you're invincible, right? I mean, no. yeah. you know, prior totally. to this call, you, I mean, it's the last thing you think is going to happen. No. And then another aha moment sitting there, he said, you need to start wearing sun protective clothing. 
And I said, I'm like, well, what the hell is that? I'm, I'm the one going on the news for these magazines and telling people like what they should be wearing. White is the new black or whatever it is for that season. And he said, no, your regular lightweight clothing provides the equivalent of SPF five. So you wouldn't walk outside with SPF five on feeling like you're protected. But I was like, well, how come you don't get burned through it? And the UVA rays are going through. And I was just like absorbing this all, absorbing it. And then another thing that you don't think about till you're older and later is that 90% of the visible signs of aging come from the sun. So mm-hmm. that didn't really affect me as much then because I was 26 and still feeling pretty, pretty good. But like all these other stats, I was like, oh my gosh. So I said, what is it? Sun protective clothing. Um, he brings in a catalog and I open it up and I was like, huh, no wonder nobody's talking about it or I've never heard of it or seen it sold anywhere. I'm like, it's fluorescent. It's a synthetic. It's like a zoot suit. I'm not putting yeah, it on with ugly. the light. Like, You're not going to wear it. Oh my gosh. Totally. And I like said to him, I'm like, does it have to be ugly to work? Like totally serious. And he's like, I, I don't think so. I don't know, but I don't think it has to be ugly. So that's so that where the, the idea whole category as a whole was just filled with, I mean, I remember that and it's just, it was filled with almost looking like, you know, child kids Mm -hmm. fun stuff but not really stuff that you would want to actually wear out and especially if you're sitting outside and you know and and that that is that was just totally what year was this exactly so that um it was primarily it was primarily in catalogs too like it wasn't at mainstream stores that was 2001 Mm -hmm. so it was um like mostly through catalogs so my mission in starting to ban a life is like, I wanted to create something that didn't make people sacrifice their sense of style, something that could sit on a shelf, like at a regular normal store and be fashionable enough that it could be like sold anywhere and that people would want to buy it because they like the style and bonus it's sun protective. So that was like a big thing of like getting in like desirable stores and having it readily available beyond just like a catalog of, um, you know, these kind of like zoot suits. So what surprised you about about this industry? I mean, did did it just seem so obvious to you, right? Like I I just feel like they're they were just trying to just put it out cuz they knew people had to have it, but nobody really had focused on having fashionable cool stuff. And if you guys haven't seen Cabana Life, it's just it's really really awesome stuff. So I oh, I you. really I love it and it's definitely um you know, I think I just I I remember back in 2001, I mean, that it was really terrible. So and nobody was talking about it. Like not one person was really talking about it. So that's where like the idea came from. Of course, I didn't jump right in. I kept my magazine job, was researching, coming up with logos, having to learn all about fabrics. And I knew nothing about manufacturing clothing, right? This was all just, okay, I'm going to make it happen somehow and figure this out. Um, and I don't know why, you know, nobody had really been doing it, but got started finally after like years of kind of dabbling. Mm-hmm. I remember saying it out loud, you know, my, I, and it's all been self-funded up until this point, right? Um, but it continues to be, but we didn't have, you know, we didn't go out and raise money and have big VC money in there. It was just like, like building, 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 building. And believe it or not, we started with just children's clothing, children's playwear, because I felt like at that time, it was a lot easier to get the message across to parents who were concerned about their Mm -hmm. kids. My best friend came to visit me after like my surgery. She came to visit me from the tanning salon. I was like, how did the, none of this like click in for you? Right. So I'm like, okay, clearly we're not the market for it. Right. The market wasn't ready for that yet for really cool women's wear. So we started with kids where we felt like your parent would sacrifice showering, eating, whatever for the health and wellness of their kid. So um, we really didn't have kids. And at the time when I was doing all the research, I was freelancing still for the magazines. And um, I remember the first time I said it out loud, a girl who I worked at Vanity Fair with, um, she was thinking of going to freelance and wanted to know how I was getting all my gigs. And she asked me out to lunch and we knew each other business wise, um, but not, you know, we weren't really friends. Yeah. And um, I remember she was asking me all these questions about freelancing. And I finally said, I'm like, well, I think I'm actually going to step away from that to start this company that I've been 
researching and she just went at me. She's like, what is it? Tell me about it. Tell me about it. And I started telling her more and more. And it totally resonated with her because unbeknownst to me at the time, her mother-in-law and her grandmother both had skin cancer. And over the course of the company, unfortunately passed away from it, both of them. So she was like, I'll help you. And I was like, well, I can't pay you. Um, She's like, no, I'll freelance and help you on the side. And 15 years ago, um, we started just in this industry that we knew nothing about other than the marketing and PR side of it. And um, born was Cabana Life and we just went after it. I love it. And so the kids clothing, what was the first piece that you ever made? Oh my gosh. It was a Terry hoodie. And actually my daughter, who's now, we were talking about going off. She's looking at colleges soon. She was in the Wall Street Journal and the black and white picture wearing this Terry hoodie because all of our friends and family had to be the models at the time too. I love it. And we got this Terry cloth and then we went to mood fabric because I couldn't figure out how to make prints in sun protective fabric at that point yet. So we had the Terry cloth and then we had it lined with this fabric from mood fabrics in New York City. Anyone that watches Project Runway is familiar with them. So that's where we got started with these like hoodies and polo shirts. And again, we just were trying to pump that message into people. So we started making logos and things that would change color in the sun. So the things that you see are the cheesy vacation yeah. stores. Um, we would put on like a polo shirt in a palm tree so that if you saw it go from like clear to green, you knew your kid was being exposed to the sun. And even when you're by a window, those things would light up. And I think that was a big aha moment. And trying to get stores who had never heard of this to, you know, make room on their shelves for us. Um, we sat at our trade show with our UV light and these icons and would sit there like selling them, lighting them up. And these people didn't know what to do with us. We just were like so passionate, so driven. We were in our little five foot by five foot booth. And, um, you know, we were like, we'll do marketing and PR and like, cause that's what we had to fall back on. Yeah. I love it. So your first stores, uh, you took it to stores versus doing it direct to consumer. Yes. And you took it to stores. So how did you think about like a retail strategy? Obviously you weren't going and getting it into the big, you know, Target or Macy's right off the bat. How did you think about that? So what I remembered from my piecework slash kind bar days, I would go to the fancy food shows. So I had like a little bit of trade show knowledge and we signed up for a booth at the very last minute. This five foot by five foot, nothing with nothing. We happened to have the good fortune of being on the food line where all the buyers lined up. So while they were waiting for their food, we'd like attack them with our UV light. And, um, and that's how we just started getting into the stores. But like I said, our background, both of us, um, cause we came from very similar backgrounds was the marketing PR celebrity thing, which was at that time, traditional press and, you know, celebs, there were no influencers, there were no reality stars like there are today. Um, and we, that we had that on lockdown. I mean, we went out so hard with all of that, that we were, you know, um, Good Morning America and all those publications that you listed and on some of those celebrities before we even had very much in stores. So we did ultimately in falling back on what we knew how to do, we did end up attracting like all of a sudden we started getting calls from like Disney and Banana Boat. And we had like our stuff in minimal amount of stores. We still didn't know what the heck we were doing. Wow. And they were like, we want you to make sun protective clothing for us. I'm like, they idea. We have no idea what we're doing. And so then we use that to leverage, um, you know, different manufacturing relationships and licensing deals and to use that to continue to grow the business, fuel the business. And in order to get that, you know, I went to Huntsman, which was doing a lot in the fabric additive and fabric space and said to them, hey, you know, give me money for a PR budget and I'll get your name along with our name in front of all of these uh, end consumers by getting you um, in the Wall Street Journal and Oprah and Good Morning America. And we did. We delivered on that. And somehow they bought into my idea to do that. But when you have nothing to lose, you can just like throw some crazy stuff out there and be prepared for a lot of no's, but there will be some yeses. Absolutely. No, I totally agree. So what has surprised you the most about becoming an entrepreneur? I think ultimately the greatest gift of it all has been this like resilience that develops in you, right? If you don't quit and you keep going, you keep going, it's like childbirth, right? You just 
it it happens. <laughs> Whatever you're dealing with is so bad at the time and you can't even think of anything else. And then miraculously, like three days later, you're on to the next thing. So I think the surprise for me is just like these traits that have evolved and continued to develop. And I'm not saying it all happened from day one. I think I didn't have the fear going into it because I wasn't really afraid and I wasn't overthinking it. I didn't have this like amazing strategy in place that if something didn't go right, I was going to pack up and go. I was just going to keep knocking on doors, figuring it out, figuring it out. And I think um, over the course of doing that and going and going and going is like, the surprising thing for me and what's so cool to speak to entrepreneurs like you and hear the stories. It's like this one thread that goes through. It's like this resilience or this grit, if you will. Right. It's like the perseverance for passion and you just go. So that's like the coolest common denominator. I think. I love it. What was the biggest order you ever got? Oh, well, and again, like childbirth, you just keep thinking of the things most recently that happened. Right. (laughs) Um, One of, one of the exciting moments, uh, pre COVID, um, we had Talbot, the big, you know, multi chain store reach out and found Cabana Life and we're like, can you do a collaboration with us on sun protective clothing? Um, so that was a, you know, separate huge collab label. Yeah. And that was just so flattering. You're like, Oh wait, cool. And, but you don't stop. You don't, you let these wins kind of resonate for two minutes if, yeah. right? And then you're and like, okay, yeah. how are we actually going to do this now? Right. So cool. that was the most recent one, but we do it for West Marine and, you know, other big retailers now too. That's so fun. And do you always have your brand at a part of it versus being pure private label? I mean, is it, is it really a co-brand? So yes, we always have our brand. I mean, we're about building the brand, building the name as a lifestyle brand. And there have been times when we've, you know, done things for other retailers that are like a lower price point, but it will still be a variation of Cabana. Um, because I do feel like, you know, we should be able to offer sun protection at all different price points, but really there is always the element of Cabana life or Cabana something in there. <laughs> How hard do you think it is to build a brand? I mean, obviously coming from a brand builder myself, I mean, it's, it's, uh, we've, we have not done private label. I mean, we did, actually, we did private label once many, many years ago, uh, 14, I think 14 years ago, we did private label and it was a huge mistake. And we haven't done private label either. We do the collaborations where we keep the name on it. And yeah. I feel like people love your brand. That's what you're, in it for right like yeah and and that's something that i think a lot of people don't realize until they're in it and i know you've been asked to to do that as well and we are we just don't do private label and and we are constantly and many beverage companies do do private label but it's just you have to figure that out like what lane are you in are you doing private label or are you building a brand and we have always believed that we you know, we made that one little detour and then we were like, that was just such a big mistake and we should not have done that. And we will never get to, you know, down the road and our goal of where we want this to go if we are not sitting there focusing on the brand. But that's so con. Like, I think that's another thing that you have to get so disciplined about. And it's really hard when you're building a brand because you're going to totally. get opportunities. And to say no to things that don't serve you, I think is like probably one of the hardest things because there will be a lot of money dangling out there to kind of do different things that might not make sense. And in your heart, you know, it's not going to be a long lasting play, but when you're, you know, building a brand and need to make money, it's kind of like this little. Yeah. And getting volume levels up is a way to do all of that. I get it. But I think it's like, you have to, I'm, I, I, Tell this to an entrepreneur a week that, you know, mm-hmm. that's if you, you really have to figure out like what lane you're going to be in and right. you can't do both. I mean, well, and really build out the brand. Otherwise, you're going to start people will catch on to that. You're going to be, you know, available for sale to do this right. private label and you will never build out the brand and what you are really focused on doing. And to your point, I think consumers also, they buy brands mm-hmm. and people look for brands. I mean, you mentioned other brands like Talbot's and Disney. And I mean, 
that is what Cabana Life is. You guys are building a brand. So I, I love hearing you talk about that too. Well, so are you. I mean, the fact that you're able to traverse from water to sunscreen to deodorant, you know, like it's a brand and people, you, you, you have the feels, right? When you hear hint and the smell yeah. and like you can almost just taste it, feel it, smell it. Like it's, it delivers something. It means something. So you don't want to go and dilute that. Yeah. Well, and I think like your, your brand, like our brand, I do feel like because you're solving a problem and there is a mission behind it, there is a trust level that is there mm -hmm. that is very, very important to consumers. And so they will tell other people about it. You know, they'll put it on social. They'll, you know, all of those things that that happen, I think, when you have a brand that people want to talk about because they love it. And obviously they know your backstory. They know my backstory of why I did not only the water, but also with our sunscreen. And by the way, if you ordered from Cabana Life in May and it's going on through June as well. Yeah, it's, I think going into June while supplies last. So while supplies last. So <laughs> you got the sunscreen and, and or you hopefully yes. got a chance if you bought uh, that. What, what was the deal? So basically exactly? it went in all you, you guys were so amazingly generous. And I think it was such a perfect partnership to align um, together for Skin Cancer Awareness Month, which is in May. So um, all Cabana Life packages went out with a substantial size hint sunscreen in it. I mean, the yeah. three, three, three ounce sunscreen and um, our, our customers, I know, were raving about it. And we got a lot Yay. of feedback. They were so excited to get that purchase. And again, it's like such a, a great compliment. It's like this healthy sunscreen you want to wear and stylish sun protection you want to wear. Because let's face it, if you don't want to use it, like it's never going to work. I mean, that's the thing with ugly sun protective clothing. It's not going to work because it's going to sit in your closet. Yeah. It has to like make you happy and smile. And so. And smell good. And you have and to smell good have experience with it and everything. I, I totally, totally agree. So innovation, I'm always talking about that in the beverage industry, that it's, it's something particularly during COVID where I think many companies just stopped like they just mm -hmm. said, we're not going to innovate. We, you know, we're going to we're just going to tighten our belts and see what happens. And I, I mean, we were continuing to, you know, do what we do, which is not only not stay complacent, but also innovate and come up with new I, new flavors and new ideas for products. We came out with a one liter bottle. We I mean, lots of different things that we were working on. So what do you think is, how is innovation in the sun garment industry, the UV uh, garment mm -hmm. industry? And, and I, I guess I feel like it kind of crosses over into sunscreen industry as well. What do you think are kind of the hot topics right now or hot innovation that people are thinking about? I think I'm just thrilled because when we started the company back so long ago, the, the, the narrative wasn't out there about the importance of sun protection. And I like to think we help build on some of it. So I love the fact that people are talking about sun protection and the need for easy sun protective solutions, um, which is obviously, you know, working in both of our favors. So I love that the, the dialogue and the understanding is there so that we can continue to innovate with new products. I mean, for us, we're always pushing it on the fabrications. We want it to be like the softest, most luxurious, Always everything we do has the 50 plus UV protection, which is the highest rating available Amazing. and blocks 98% of UVA and UVB rays. So like that's our non-negotiable point. So, but we're always trying to think of like new fabrics and silhouettes that offer that, but it's just easy and delicious and exciting to wear. Um, and then of course we're constantly innovating too, because now we have the e-commerce site. We do a lot of direct to consumer business. And I think like what you said, you guys didn't stop. We didn't stop because that's what we do, right? We're not like this, we're nimble and you're leaning in and you're pivoting and you're still following your passion, which is what drove you to start this in the first place. So of course you're not just going to like tighten your belt and sit back and wait to see what happens. Like we're on a mission, you're on a mission, right? We are driven by something else. So I love it. I think that's, you know, the cool and exciting part, even with all of the COVID stuff. So we are launching an avatar on our site next month to help people try the clothing on um, where you could put the garment on a little avatar. So 
whether it's the actual product expansion and we're doing a full fall line this year and um, pushing the envelope on fabrics or the technology side of the e-commerce um, and really working with our influencers and our technology side of it to continue to like build this momentum, build this sense of community. So we're just going, I mean, going, going. <laughs> I love, love to hear that. So Melissa, where do people find you and Cabana Life and, and where's the best place? Sure. So cabanalife.com has all of our full assortment. Um, that's where you'll find everything that we have in the collection. We're at about 400 stores throughout the country. So you could pop that's into amazing. West Marine, Dillard's, um, everything but water, lots of boutiques, independent boutiques we love, um, hotels like the Ritz Carlton's. So we're out there. You could test it out, see it, try it on, buy, support local retail. I mean, we love our retail partners. Um, and then on social media, we're Cabana Life everywhere. You want to find us. I love it. And your social is really, really terrific as well. So definitely everyone check it out. And oh, Melissa, thank, thank you. you so much for being on the show today. I really enjoyed learning a little bit more, although I, I feel like I've been following you for a while and, and I just love, I, I just love the fact that you just went out and did something that you believed in and that had purpose and you've made it an incredible company that is just so inspiring to watch you and so admirable to know where you came from, you know, just an idea and solving a problem to something big. So I think that that is just really, really, really cool. Everybody needs to check out cabanalife.com. And also just thanks everyone for listening to the podcast. Please give Melissa five stars, subscribe to the podcast <laughs> and all of that stuff. And also, if you have not picked up a bottle of Hint Water or the sunscreen that Melissa mentioned as well, the sunscreen is just so amazing. That's all on our site as well as if you go to Cabana Life. And uh, while supplies last, we've got a bottle in there, too. And uh, finally, if you have not had a chance to read my book, Undaunted Overcoming Downs and Doubters, it's about my journey. And thank you so much. And uh, it's been a lot of fun just to get it out there and allow people to know that you can do something. An idea is I'm such a huge believer that without entrepreneurs like Melissa and myself, that, you know, that that is really the the mainstay of business going forward. And I love, love, love um, hearing more and more stories like this. So thanks, everyone. Have a great week. 